Well, this is a packed house. This is really great to be here. And I want to thank uh, June Freeman in particular for giving me the chance to come down here. It's my first visit to Little Rock. And thanks for the weather. Uh, it was really nice of you to make it so nice for me. And I've been seeing so many wonderful buildings and the city and listening to people talk about architecture and the city and creative placemaking all day that if I had a time, I probably should have rewritten my lecture to incorporate some of this. But I'll try to incorporate some of that as I talk. So what I'm going to talk about tonight, as you can guess, is intelligent cities. And that is the name of a project that I worked on for a year with the National Building Museum. And it's also a way of thinking about cities and a way of looking at how cities are, how they communicate, how they embody information, how they exchange information, and really how we think about the future of cities. So this was a project the National Building Museum got involved with thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation came to us with, uh, I guess the easiest way to say it is they came to us with uh, two facts and one question. And they were sort of deceptively simple. So fact number one, and we'll get some visuals here. Sometimes the slides directly relate to what I'm saying. Sometimes they're just things for you to look at while I'm talking. Uh, how many architects are in the house, just out of curiosity? OK, architects are used to just looking at things. You can't go to an audience full of architects and talk without something to look at. Um, so although I have one of my former students here, Mary Jean, Mary Jean knows that I actually do sometimes talk without slides. Um, so fact number one that the Rockefeller Center, the Wa Rockefeller Foundation came to us with was for the first time in human history, and this may be a fact all of you know, the majority of the world's populations live in cities or in urban environments. We use the word cities sort of as a shorthand to try to describe what we're talking about. But for the first time in human history, more than half the world's population lives in an urban setting, and that's unprecedented. Fact number two, for the first time in human history, we actually possess powerful information and communication technologies. And all of you, most of you probably have them in your pocket. So we know more about these urban environments. We know more, more about ourselves. And we can, can communicate that knowledge instantaneously. So another show of hands. How many of you found out about this lecture through some digital delivery system? OK, did anybody not find out about it that way? Did anybody found out about it word of mouth? Yes. That is also an information and communication technology. And while I might be talking about a lot of the high tech things, we don't want to forget that person to person communication and conversation and the city street or the places where that takes place is also part of the conversation. So those are our two facts. And then the question. And the question was that the Rockefeller Foundation wanted us to investigate is what happens in terms of urban design, in terms of architecture, in terms of planning, and governance and livability at the intersection of those two facts. So given unprecedented population, given unprecedented information and communication technologies, what happens? So that's a simple question, right? Not so simple. So here's my little break for a commercial from my institution. This is the interior of the National Building Museum. Has anyone been there? Mary Jean's been there, a few people, okay, so you recognize that. And I think when I saw this building, uh, which I think is from the 1890s, I think that's what someone told me, it's definitely a cousin to the National Building Museum, the building we're in right now. And the National Building Museum brings um, a unique perspective to these questions, to this question that Rockefeller asked us. It's the only museum in the country that's dedicated to the full spectrum of building arts and sciences from craft technologies from masonry, from the construction trades, all the way through urban planning and regional planning, inclusive, of course, of architecture and landscape <coughs> architecture. <clears throat> Excuse me. So over the past year, we've been looking at this question, and we've been using these same information and communication technologies that I'm talking about to basically invite the public to give us answer questions we put on our website, answer questions that we had because we were curious about, well, if we have this technology to know so much about how people think about where they lived and think about cities, well, let's see what we can find out. So we spent about a six months in an outreach campaign uh, using our own website and using uh, time.com and Time Magazine. We had Time Magazine as a partner and IBM, so it definitely felt like we were playing um, in the major leagues. It was quite an experience. 
And so each month we sort of posed a few questions and we had people answer these polling questions and then we put infographics up. And it got people thinking about how did they choose where to live? How do they get around? And so it's worth, I mean, a, you can think about those questions too, and if you want, you can go to our website, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, and I think those questions are still open. And we wanted people to really reflect on how they made those decisions and if they would make those same decisions again if they had different information. I mean, you think about, well, how did you pick where you live? Well, a friend of yours told you it was a nice neighborhood or the real estate agent told you that this was the one you should live in, or you found some data about it, or you just fell in love with the house. How do you get around? Do you always use your car? Do you think about it? So these were some of the questions we asked people. Do you let your children walk to school? Did you walk to school when you were younger? And we posed all these questions along with infographics each month, which were related to the kind of questions. And we really sort of did a sort of concentric scaling out from, and we're working from the top, from the home closest to the self, uh, to the neighborhood, community, um, city, region, and country. And I'm not really gonna talk about each of these, otherwise we would be here all night. Um, and I was told not to do that again. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, but you can go to the, uh, you can go to the website. These are all reproduced in the book. And you can go to the website and there's a little mini essay that goes with each one of these. But what we're using is we're using infographics. And we had a great graphic design firm from uh, Brooklyn called Management. But being clever graphic designers, it's a small MGMT with a period. So you call it Management, but it's MGMT. I don't know, it's graphic design cuteness. But anyway, it's nice and they do great work. Um, and so what we were interested in doing was taking data and then sort of layering different data and looking for correlations, not necessarily causation. We weren't really pretending that this was scientific, but we were trying to present snapshots of energy use, of childhood obesity versus how many children are being driven to school, cars in the city, um, all sorts of really interesting facts. And yeah, here you go. It's easy to find if you want to look more of it. Uh, NBM.org is really the one you need to remember. You can then query intelligent cities. You can just Google intelligent cities and a whole bunch of stuff will come up. Um, more than you can stand and it will keep you busy for a while. So why, why did we use these infographics, right? Why go to the um, trouble of commissioning actually a designer, information designers to put this material together? Um, well, one of the points we're trying to make is that for information to be actionable, that is for us to be able to use it to actually make better decisions, we have to really understand what it is. And if you've ever gone to a website like, well, if you've ever gone to the Census Bureau website and tried to actually look at raw census data, or my favorite, um, data.gov, has anyone looked at data.gov? That's just a delight of what it is. I mean, it's great. There's all the information you could ever want that the government has collected, and good for them but it is as user hostile an interface as you're gonna find. So we figured, someone says, well, you can find that out. All that information is out there. But the problem is it's actually out there in a language that few of us are comfortable in, the language of statistics and spreadsheets and even a pie chart doesn't quite get at what's interesting. And so for all of us to become more intelligent citizens, we need to find a way to develop shared languages. And design is really part of that. So again, all of these are reproduced in the book. Um, the common thread among all of the infographics is, and the outreach, and really the theme of uh, what I'm gonna talk about tonight in depth, is the relationships among these three variables of technology, cities, and people. People being the key thing, because there's no point talking about technology and cities if we're not really talking about us. That's what it's all for. And of course, how out of those relationships, of technology, cities, and people, we can make our cities better and more intelligent. And of course, if we're talking about technology, cities, and intelligence, those are big comprehensive terms about which we could give, well, entire seminars on, not just entire lectures. But I'm gonna try to get us to some working definitions so at least we have a shared uh, grasp of what I'm talking about. So we'll take intelligence first. <coughs> And I've given a lot of uh, thought to this one because it's in some ways the hardest one to define. Um, sociologist and education writer Howard Gardner has written entire books trying to define intelligence. And he's, I think, discovered that we have seven or eight different forms of intelligence. We have 
you know, kinesthetic intelligence, we have musical intelligence, we have interpersonal intelligence. And I got interested in seeing if we can actually think about those same things mapped onto a city. So we think about a city's intelligence as being very quantifiable, but in fact, a city's intelligence also includes all of these, actually if anyone was at the discussion with Rocco Landsman earlier, all of these things about creative placemaking that were part of that discussion. So a city's intelligence can include information like crime statistics, um, educational attainment, property values, um, traffic counts, um, property rates, tax rolls, but it also has creative production, it has its own urban myths, the stories that people tell about it and about the buildings. The information is actually embodied in the buildings themselves, like a building like this contains information about when it was built, by how high the ceilings are, how it was made, where the waterways are. So it's the very structure of, structure of the city and its buildings. So whatever kind of intelligence we're talking about, though, it's composed really of information and communication. So under that heading of intelligence, there information and communication, because intelligence, there's no point in keeping it separate, right? The point of making ourselves intelligent is to communicate. And I visited a great building today. This was uh, one of my high points. I went to see the Heifer International headquarters. And I got a tour from Reese. Is Reese here? He probably was too busy to come here. Reese uh, Roland, the architect. And we got into a discussion about um, how the building, you know, energy performance is monitored, uh, water usage, he can document, the owners can document how much better it performs than a building that's more of ordinary construction. And that's a great set of data, and that data can be used to sort of prove and to prove to other architects how to improve their buildings. But it also has this whole other set of information and intelligence which we got from watching people use it and from listening to people sort of incognito. Reese said he likes to sort of go there and not tell anyone he's the architect so we can hear what they have to say. And so the comments about he, how people interact with the building and how they feel about it is also part of the intelligence. And so that as a building is also a good example about thinking how those properties actually map to a city. That was a great building. You, you're very lucky to have that in your, in your city. Uh, anybody recognize this city? That's Washington. And it's a really funny map of Washington. And so this is where we'll talk a little about what on earth is a city. This is from um, a website, uh, an artist called uh, Eric Fisher. Is that his name, Eric Fisher? Yes. Eric Fisher, who's a visualization designer, and he's amassed through a way I don't entirely understand um, geopositioning data from digital photographs that people take in different cities. And people call this locals and tourists, and if you Google that, you can find these maps for cities all over. And what it is, the red signifies a place where a visitor to the city took a photograph. And the blue signifies the place where someone who's local took a photograph. How he knows that, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, maybe we don't want to know. Uh, we're not going to talk about privacy issues that hovers behind all of these. Yellow is he couldn't determine it. And so what's fascinating to me, and Washington is such a vivid example, is you can see the monumental core outlined in red, simply built up dot by dot by dot by all of the people who took pictures down there. And all the blue, that's what my city is, right? That's all the locals. We're taking pictures of our own streets and our own neighborhoods and our own street festivals and things that are important to us. So not only does it tell a story about Washington and how distinct those different parts of the cities are, but it actually is a sort of map of significance. The one thing that's missing is the jurisdictional boundary. So you really don't see where the District of Columbia ends. And we think of a city as having a very specific jurisdictional condition. It's defined by a type of governance. You know, we can say, well, this is a city, this is a county. But to sort of use city kind of with a capital C, the way we're using it today in terms of intelligent cities, brings in this whole agglomeration of incorporated cities, unincorporated cities, gated communities, subdivisions, unincorporated towns, counties, informal settlements, once you leave the US, cities take on an entirely different quality. And that all of these are sort of grouted together, almost like a mosaic is a good analogy, through commuting patterns, watersheds, transportation networks, 
and a whole sort of patchwork of governance of public health, so social services, and regulations. So while the city de jure, Latin alert, I am an academic after all, the city de jure, that is by law, has its boundaries. We don't really perceive those boundaries. We don't live them. So the de city de facto is that thing that we experience. Um, and so then, this is for the architects in the audience, these are the, this is the evolution of tools and, uh, and the design studio. Uh, this is sort of humorous. Um, I do have another book that uh, you can find on the Building Museum website called Tools of the Imagination, which is a history of drawing tools from the 18th century to the present. And we had some of these photographs, and I thought I needed to add the last one, which of course is the iPad. Right, so we've got the old set square, we've got that crazy machine that cleaned those irritating pens that we, well, at least some of us used to use. And then the iPad, which is sort of not only replaced, not entirely, uh, my students still draw, um, but it's re not only replaced some of those drawing tools, but it's added all sorts of other stuff, right? It's the phone, it's the communication device, it's everything. So technology, which is our third term, we've sort of defined intelligence, sort of defined city. Technology really is whatever we use to do work, right? It's the instrument, it's whatever lets us do what we've got to do. And it encompasses everything from, I keep putting on my glasses and taking them off because I can't see you if I have them on and I can't see this if I have them off. So this is a piece of technology that helps and hurts alternatively depending on what I'm trying to do. Um, I've got an analog watch, that's a piece of technology, and I've got a well-silenced um, smartphone in my purse over there. Um, and I sort of, as all of you do, we navigate through all those different levels of technology seamlessly, often without even thinking about it. And for the technologies we're going to talk about today, we're really talking about information and communication technologies, which I learned the shorthand for that are ICTs. There's an abbreviation for everything, and I didn't know that until I started this project. So ICTs, and they are, as the Beatles song uh, said, here, there, and everywhere. And that's what makes them so different from many of our other technologies. And what they do is, and you can probably sense this, they're establishing new relationships between us and them, right? So you have a very different relationship with this technology than you did 10 years ago with your landline and also establishing new relationships among us, and also between us and our world. So we've sort of defined our terms. Um, and all of these, intelligence, information, technology, and the cities, these have been with us since we first sort of gave up the hunter-gathering thing and settled in cities. It's not like this is something new. Information communication has always been at the very foundation of civilization. Cities are nothing without technology because that's how we made them. And so this is something that has been around forever. But it is also true that we're facing these unprecedented conditions, unprecedented population in cities, and unprecedented pressures on resources and unprecedented uh, technological capabilities. It's also true that even as we perceive ourselves as being unique, all of our ancestors equally found themselves in those positions. In some ways, civilizations are just one unprecedented moment after another. So in a way that gives, as an educator and sort of a historian, that gives me great context to try to understand both what's new and different today and what isn't. So speaking of context and lenses, uh, this is one of my favorite images because it reminds me that um, depending on what we're looking through, the problem's going to look very different. So we can read this, the city in different ways. If you talk to a geographer, they're going to tell you that a city's fate is determined by its site and its resources. So they're going to look at Little Rock as a river city, look at what that had to do with its development, the natural resources it, it had, how that developed an economy. Same thing with the way people would look at Washington. A political historian is going to look at a city very differently. It's about contests for power, it's about destruction, rebuilding, it's about assertions and denials of use of space. And for us architects, we can't help but look at it formally. We look at the street space, we look at the plan. It's this vast designed object that, of course, we're dying to keep designing. So whatever your disciplinary point of view, you're looking through your own lenses. But in any case, the city is a constructed thing. 
and constructing the city is the role of uh, technology. And so that role of technology in the city, again, is a master narrative of thinking of cities. And I like to think about um, where I live in Washington, it came up to me one of the first times I was thinking about this Intelligent Cities project, that just to go from where I live to my office, any one of my offices, I sort of move through at least 400 years of technology that are all still present. So the 18th century survey, surveying that laid out the city of Washington, the original streets that L'Enfant planned, and the widths. L'Enfant decided how wide our streets should be, and we've sort of kept them that way. Then there's the 19th century rail lines, the 19th century building stock, like this building we're in, the 20th century glass boxes, the 20th century cars that are omnipresent, the metro, and then certainly on my way here, the airplane that got me here. So I move through all those layers without really thinking about the fact that we don't destroy those layers entirely, or we really shouldn't, because that's actually how the city matures. Um, and there's a little example. There's Washington in the middle. I always have to put Washington in every slide. Um, so to say that cities, technology, information, and communication have always been inseparable with one another is not to diminish, again, the extraordinary changes that are taking place today. So I always like to go back to the 19th century. And I don't know why that is. I'm fond of the 19th century. Um, it fascinates me. And I think when we're talking about technology, it's the period we can look back to when uh, technological change radically changed the city in a way that we are still living with. Um, I mean, can you imagine in that cityscape when electrical and phone wires first came into the urban environment? Can you imagine how disruptive that was to the sort of formal order of what a city looked like? All of a sudden, stuff strung all over the sky, sticks up in the air. Um, so the shift from the pre-industrial city to the industrial city was really abrupt, and it was fast. A uh, sort of great architect and educator, John Eberhard, has written about this in a really short essay called The Great Eight. And he says that there were eight significant um, technological achievements, major technologies that were largely responsible for the city that we see today. And he claims that they were all developed and put into operation in 17, a 17-year period, which is amazing, between 1876 and 1893. And the grade eight were, usually when I'm teaching, I make people guess, but we'll be here all night, so I'll just tell you the grade eight. Uh, structural steel, architects will know these, the elevator, usable electricity. It's not like we didn't know electricity was out there, but it's not much use if you can't make it behave itself. Usable electricity, central heating, sanitary water and sewer systems, the telephone, the automobile, and the subway. And think about the impact those had on our cities. Now of those eight, a few of them bear directly on what we're talking about, information and communication technologies. It may seem a little bit counterintuitive, but they include structural steel, the elevator, and the mobility technologies of automobile, subway, and telephone. You're thinking, telephone? They weren't mobile back then, but the telephone has actually always been a mobility technology, which is kind of interesting to think about. These are also space transcending technologies, to use a term that um, technology writer Claude Fisher developed. And all of them, the ones I just listed, made two things possible, which have been the sort of, you know, I guess the heart of debate about the American city ever since. They made density and decentralization both equally possible. And there was much debate during that period in the 19th century and the early 20th century about which way things were going to go. Um, the elevator, the automobile, and the subway moved people faster than anyone had ever moved before and in directions nobody had ever moved before. Up. I mean, can you imagine the first time you rode in an elevator? I'm sure people were terrified. I still know people who aren't terribly happy about it. Um, the telephone did its thing by, it moved the information fast and it let you stay put. That was also quite radical. And there were concerns that the telephone would render the city center obsolete. In fact, this is a wonderful quote from uh, Claude Fisher's book, which is called America Calling, A Social History of the Telephone. And he writes about a magazine article that was written in 1893 about what life was going to be like in 1993, in which families would live on scattered homesteads, neighbored only by people of like sentiment and quality. 
and they would conduct their work electronically and only meet one another on ceremonial occasions. Like so many generalizations, this is both remarkably true and also not entirely true. But there is that sort of like, wow, he was prescient. Um, certainly, and I can speak mostly about my own city, the exurbs of Washington are really populated, they're monocultures, largely of class, race, and age. And we increasingly socialize, shop, and participate in civic life even electronically, right? We have those devices that we can do everything with. And many in these environments literally venture into the city only for those special occasions, which is a very different model from 100 years ago. But it's important to remember that, that anyone, because often when they come into the city, they find a bunch of people who have made the exact opposite decision, which is to live in this city because technology lets them do it in a different way. And that anyone actually has an authentic choice about that is really a question for public policy, planning, and design. In that order, public policy does tend to come first. So the space transcending technologies, all of these old photographs, the Library of Congress, again, you can get all this online. The Library of Congress has amazing stock photos uh, that you can use without any royalties. So space tran transcending technologies are also by definition time transcending. So the private automobile collapses both what we think of as near and far, but it also collapses soon and later. Uh, here's a funny little anecdote. The first time I went to Germany, I wasn't going to include anecdotes, but this is a funny one. First time I went to Germany, my husband and I rented a little tiny uh, Fiat thing. Um, this was in the 80s. I don't, it was a lawnmower um, with seats and a cover. And we, were in, we thought, well, this would be great. We're going to drive to Rome in this. So we were in Frankfurt, and we were trying to get to Stuttgart. And we asked these gentlemen at the table next to us, how long is it to Stuttgart? And they said, what are you driving? And that was, to me, that was like, what's it to you, what we're driving? It was such a bizarre non sequitur. And I thought, well, why are these Germans so nosy? And it's because in Germany, because of the speed limit, it matters. Things are near or far, depend, and they take this long or that long, depending on what you're driving. So we told them, and they laughed <laughs> and said, it's going to take you hours to get to Stuttgart. Um, but so that's. That's technology, actually changing space-time, and it's also culturally situated, right? Because that would be a weird answer to give someone uh, in an American city. So funny thing about the telephone, of course, and you can think about the shift from the landline to mobile, uh, sort of with this one switch. When you used to call someone on a landline, and some of us still do this, you knew where you were calling, but you weren't entirely sure who was going to answer. So we all learned to say, this is so-and-so, uh, you know, may I speak to your mother? Uh, with cell phones, you know who you're calling, but you have no idea where they are. So to utter a sentence like I did last night to my husband where I said, okay, I just landed in Little Rock, you would never, that's 20 years ago, that wouldn't have made any sense at all. You, you know, you would have gone to a payphone maybe, but then the payphone is also in Little Rock. So that's how fast things have changed. So of course, the consequences of this on the design of the physical environment this change of technology, how this is happening, just to take the phones, for example, are at once striking. I mean, where did all the phone booths go? Are they, you know, are they in a salt cave in Nevada somewhere being stored? They just vanished. And it's also kind of odd because we still need privacy and we sort of forgot that the phone booth wasn't just a thing that had the phone in it, but it was a thing that kept our conversation private from all of the other people who perhaps didn't want to hear it. Um, and so what are the possible design responses to a new kind of private space that follows us around as we move through the public realm? Right, so now we're carrying these bubbles of disattenuation, trying not to pay attention to people as they talk on their phones. Then you have texting, which doesn't intrude on your sound, but people will stop in the middle of the street and text. And so I think of those old turnouts on highways where you turn out for the payphone, and you know, should we design our sidewalks that way, where you have little text walker pullouts? And I sort of thought, I can't take total credit for thinking of that clever thought, because I had a thesis student um, last year, and she designed a building with lots of staircases. She was very interested in active design. And she designed her staircases with benches and ledges and tables sticking out from it. And um, one of the critics said, wouldn't it be easier just, you know, just to make it simple? And she said, well, but that's not going to help, because you're coming home, you've got bags in each hand, and your cell phone rings. 
you need a place to put your stuff so you can get your cell phone out and take the call. And that to me was such a radical yet simple thought because as a sensitive architect, she had faced that. And her stuff falls down the stairs and she's thinking, well, these stairs were made for one technology, which is just walking. Although in the 19th century, we made them with landings, with benches and places to sit. So there's a different kind of thinking about how to design something generous like that. Uh, so I hope she'll get to build one of those staircases. So we go from those old phone booths to this. And thinking about the great eight technologies that shaped the 19th century city, of course, makes me wonder what are the greats that are shaping the post-industrial city or the information age city. And again, I won't throw that out as a quiz, but we could probably put together a list that includes fiber optics, silicon chip, got to have that one. We're nothing without our lithium batteries. The laser, I've got one of these. I could point it, prove that, but I don't really need to. Uh, satellites and the massive rockets that uh, make them possible. These are some of the underlying technologies that make those little tiny devices you carry around in your pocket and your briefcase possible. And those devices are tiny and they're getting smaller and smaller, right, so that our thumbs aren't even um, sized for them. But it's not, but they're components in an almost incomprehensibly huge network. So you're thinking about these two extreme scales. We have something that fits in your pocket, and it's tied to a network that we can't even really imagine. And that scale, I think, is a particular challenge to architects, urban designers and landscape architects, because these other technologies that the 19th century bequeathed us, they sort of inhabited space with us. You know, you can get in an elevator, you can see structural steel, you see a train going through the street. But these technologies, they're at the opposite ends of a scale where building and city and landscape are somehow not directly touching them. So they pose a really interesting design problem where we might have had a hard time figuring what kind of city we wanted to make with the older technologies. This is happening while I'm speaking and we're not entirely sure what the city is gonna look like with these technologies. So when we think about scale, as designers understand it, scale is always relative. So something is always larger than, faster than, older than, something else, and it's usually us, because we're the measure of all things. And so the urban technologies previously were big, fast, strong, they made big buildings. Our technologies today are faster than we can imagine, tiny, to even in the case, uh, invisible in nanotechnologies. And they're actually, their strength is entirely different kind of strength than we think that structural steel has. So we're actually, we, I think, reconceptualizing a different set of building materials in ICTs. And frankly, it's kind of a weird slide. It turned out weirder than I expected, but it's uh, nice to get the first perspective. I'm not entirely sure we've digested our 19th century technologies completely. Um, the elevator, we still have sort of strange social behavior issues in elevators. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting sociological literature on it. But the elevator's impact had more to do with changing the scale of buildings that are on streets, which then changes the relationship of the people in the upper floors to the street. It changes the relationship of those people to each other. It's an entirely different social milieu when you have an elevator building. Cars, don't get me started. Uh, cars change streets entirely. I'm sort of, it's kind of a joke among my, my peers and what, I don't have a car, and so I'm sort of a, I'm made fun of as this anti-car uh, raving person, but I, I don't rave about not having a car, but a good rant occasionally is healthy. Um, and so the car completely changes what the street space is for. Right now it becomes what Richard Sennett writes about in the fall of Public Man, where he says, today we experience an ease of motion unknown to any prior urban civilization. And yet motion, and by this he means automobile travel, has become the most anxiety laden of daily activities. And he really lamenting really the end of the traditional city, he says the technology of modern motion replaces being in the street just as a public space to be in the street with a desire to erase the constraints of geography. And it's sort of interesting to think of the, the street becomes the way to get out of wherever you are because you're in your car instead of the street being the place that you want to be. Which having listened to the discussion or, earlier today about creative placemaking and how sort of 
enjoying and celebrating the local and getting people to stay put and think about their own city, we do face this challenge about what, who's in that street and what kind of technology have we given it to. Um, in fact, every conversation, mark my words, about urban development, and all of you probably know this, devolves into an argument about traffic and parking. Whatever the other benefits are, every conversation about urban development devolves into a discussion of traffic and parking. Now, this is a weird image. Anybody seen this image? This is showing something that's invisible and making it visible. And there's a beautiful film you can find. Where else? On YouTube. You can Google this. Um, and it's two uh, artists in Norway did a short film where they rigged up a stick with LED lights and a sensor. And they would light up whenever they picked up a Wi-Fi signal. And they walked through a snowy night in Oslo. And you see this shape, this thing, changing its profile as they pass through a Wi-Fi signal. And it'll drop off, and it'll pick up again. And it's telling this really amazing story that now we have this technology that's completely invisible to us. And what that says is that invisible thing is actually changing how we're inhabiting our public spaces now. So in fact, despite the fears that, and they were fears in the 19th and early 20th century, and fears now, that our, mo our communication technologies would drive us all into lives of wireless isolation, echoing all those 19th century fears, something of the opposite is happening, and it's being documented. Our parks, plazas, open spaces are actually being filled up and returning to the role that they filled actually generations ago, which is places for people to share, hang out, linger, read, write, communicate, gossip, debate. Some of that they're doing face to face, and some of it they're doing through a device to someone in another public space somewhere else. And so I think what, again, to go back to our original question, what does that mean for how we design our cities and how we design our public spaces? That technology is an integral part, not only of the design and construction process, but actually of the user experience of the city. Um, in 1980, and some of you are probably familiar with this, William White, William Holly White, published a great little book, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, which looked at how people used open space in the city. And he focused on Manhattan. And he was curious about why some parks and plazas in Manhattan were full of people and some of them were empty. And architecturally, you couldn't always tell which was which. Sometimes the modernist ones were full, and the traditional ones were empty, and sometimes vice versa. And so White began to watch people and film them. And he actually got a grant to do this from uh, the National Geographic Foundation, not from the AIA or the APA or the government of uh, New York City, because he told National Geographic that this was the same kind of ethnographic field work that they funded in other countries. And that he wanted to do was document this inhabitant of Manhattan in his natural environment and see how he actually behaved. And it was amazing because no systematic research had ever been done about urban people and how they use space. And you've probably all seen these wonderful images of Paley Park, one of the best pocket parks in Manhattan. And so he uh, documented this and his conclusions after this huge grant from National Geographic and filming and sending his students out to do this work, his conclusions were delightfully obvious. They were, quote, people tend to sit where there are places to sit and, close quotes, quote, people prefer to be where there are other people. So there you go. That's, that's like urban design 101. Interestingly, following in his footsteps, a young professor, assistant professor at um, University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg School of Communication, Keith Hampton, has done, has revisited this research. And he has gone with teams of students sort of following the same protocol to a couple of parks and plazas across North America, including Bryant Park, not Paley Park, but the new Bryant Park. And he wanted to see how digital technologies were changing this phenomenon that William White discovered, and also whether they were really empty, right? Were people just hovered up in their den, you know, on Facebook all by themselves? And his research showed that 25% of the people, that's one in four, who he interviewed admitted that they had not been in that particular public space until Wi-Fi was available. One in four, which is amazing. And they said they came more often because of the Wi-Fi. So what's ironic to me, and again, thinking of Manhattan, thinking of Bryant Park, is from its birth in the 19th century, the idea behind the urban park was to give people an escape 
from those machines and technologies of the 19th century that were so disruptive to our lives and so unhealthy to us. The park was for leisure, not for work, and it was defined as such. Well, Hampton found out that not only were people coming because of Wi-Fi, that over half the people in Bryant Park were working. Now, not, kind of, not the kind of work you do, did in the 19th century, but half the people were sitting there in Bryant Park working. So that is a really interesting challenge, I think, to what's different in how we want to think about how we're designing our cities. But it also reminds us, and this is, again, one of those great context-setting quotes from another author. So you're going to earn your AIA credits tonight. I've mentioned many really good books and authors, so there's a little bit of scholarship in there. Um, that human beings do not stop congregating as they acquire telecommunications. I mean, that's why we're all in this room, right? We could have done this, I guess, technologically, but it wouldn't be anywhere near as much fun. Any more than they ceased talking when they learned to write. Communication is not a simple substitute for transportation, which is sort of a wonderful way of saying it's never, you will never drive people away from other people because, like White observed, even if they've got earplugs in their head, even if they've got an iPhone or they've got a laptop, they still want to sit where there are places to sit and they still want to be where there are other people. Um, so to Jane Jacobs, you know, another New York hero, New, hero, New York was a better place because of the eyes on the street, right? That's one of her classic expressions. And so if Jane were, what would Jane say? Well, if the eyes are on the iPad or the ears have earbuds, how does that actually change the city? Right, if 51% of the people in Bryant Park are working, but Hampton's research indicates they're still paying attention and they still will talk to people around them and show them, I don't know, the funny cat video on YouTube, which is a great conversation starter, cats. And so this is, of course, a design issue. This is something to think about as we're thinking about uh, how we design places in our cities and what a public park is or what a plaza is. Traditionally, we've associated those places with leisure and festivals and those ceremonial occasions that in, 19, that in 1893 they thought we would come into the city for. But we've already blurred the boundaries between um, home and work by telecommuting and teleconferencing. And now our ICTs are blurring really our ability to tell what anyone is doing at any given time anywhere. So if you start think of the, ja the classic categories of zoning, well, we have work, we have shopping, we have residential, we have special uses. People actually want to do all of that at once. And in terms of even the way an architecture firm is set up, we have specialists who do, do this and do that. Well, landscape architects might end up leading a project that you know, involves workplace. That's kind of an unusual way to think about workplace design is handing it off to the landscape architect. Architects might not be kind of nervous about that, so. But it's a thought-provoking idea. So, so even as our technological objects are getting smaller and smaller, we're still taking up space, and in a good way, right? We're still occupying those chairs and those public parks. And so in some ways, we sort of took this question of how unprecedented our current situation is and discovered that, yes, that's true, but that there's an awful lot actually looking back to how we have originally designed our cities, how we've thought about work, leisure, public space, the street, that can actually help us as we move forward. And so, as we sort of concluded this, um, I figured we had to come up with a set number of conclusions. You always have to end with a set number of conclusions. And they're not really conclusions, they're kind of challenges, caveats, reminders. I had a hard time figuring out what to call them, and they're in the book. Um, and I came up with five because that's a good number that you can remember. And back when, actually, the telephone was new, this is my last anecdote, uh, there was great fear among sort of experts on psychology and sociology that people would be incapable of remembering seven numbers. That the seven number phone number and this would just be a disaster. And so some of you re may remember that uh, the exchange used to be a word, right? So it was. Murray Hill or Diamond or whatever it is, and then you had the four numbers. And that was so you could remember that. And then you only had to remember the four numbers. Now, of course, we have to remember the area code and the seven numbers, and we remember zip codes, zip, zip code plus four. We have myriad passwords we have to remember. So part of this is, well, we're getting intelligent with our cities, right? We're sort of marching along with them. So, but I stuck with five. So I've got five reminders to think about for, um, continuing 
because it's not like we haven't been working at this all along. We've been trying to make our cities better and more intelligent, but now we've got some new ways to do it. So number one is framing is everything. And every designer knows this. Depending on what you clip out of the issues that you want to deal with, your solution is going to be more or less successful. And you can see this in the history of urban design when we decided, well, we're only going to look at this problem, like slum clearance, and we wipe out entire neighborhoods and we build something else. And we sort of forgot that all of those people and that community was connected to a host of other things in the city. And so we have a history of solving the wrong problem perfectly. And you can solve the wrong problem perfectly by tightening the frame around it. On the other hand, you can shift that frame around and start to see that, well, if you reframe the problem of affordable housing, and this is the Center for Innovative Technology in Chicago has done this, if you all of a sudden say, well, it isn't just the house that we're going to talk about, it's transportation cost. All of a sudden, all that cheap housing in the outskirts of Chicago gets very expensive because people have to have a car that's reliable, they have to pay gas. So changing the frame is a very powerful way, again, to bring data to bear on the problem and to say, let's look at our city differently by changing our lenses, changing our frame. So actually framing the problem correctly determines the success of the solution. This is a really huge one. And again, my tour of uh, Heifer International Headquarters just sort of reminded me again how important this is. Not only do we want to make buildings that are perf high performance buildings and save energy, but they also ought to make us feel better. They ought to make us healthier. They ought to make us want to take the stairs. And this goes back to a very 19th century, actually even before that, the idea that public health and urban design and architecture are all together. And I think this is increasingly going to be a sort of dominant aspect of design. Uh, Howie Frumkin, well, Dr. Howard Frumkin, uh, formerly of the CDC, who's now the dean at University of Washington School of Public Health, he likes to say in lectures, OK, I've got something for you. It's going to lower your blood pressure. It's going to improve your cardiovascular health. It's going to help you lose a few pounds. It's going to make your neighborhood safer. It's going to reduce your chances of being in a car crash. And it's going to lower your carbon footprint and reduce your overall stress level and probably your financial health. It'll increase that with no detrimental effects. Would you like a prescription for that? And everyone's like, yes. He said, it's a sidewalk. <laughs> it's a sidewalk. It's concrete. I mean, OK, little, you might get shin splints if you run on it. But that's, you know, he's talking about walking. Um, and the fact that public health has a long tradition of data. They want to know that things work. And the design and planning professions can now use that. That's a very powerful tool to actually make our environments better. In some ways, our information and communication technologies have pulled away all of our excuses of, well, I didn't know. Actually, now there's, uh, there's no more uh, not knowing. There's no more, from now on, there's no more not knowing. Um, it's just like you can't play trivia with anyone anymore because they can always pull out their phone and check you. So there's no more not knowing. Um, bridging the digital divide begins in the analog world. This one may not sound at first like it's a design issue, but it's a reminder that, as um, Judith Roden, the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, said at our forum, not everyone in the world is like everyone in this room. And it's the reminder that even as I'm talking about, oh, all of us have cell phones, and all of us can do this, and all of us do that, not all of us do. Some of those barriers are economic. Some of them are sociocultural. Some of them are linguistic. Some of them are generational. And some of them increasingly are urban-rural divide. We used to think of the digital divide as being a sort of urban poor versus suburban prosperity, but it's increasingly framed in all these different aspects. And it has to do with how people can be informed about the changes to their own environment. And so that's where planning and architecture and design really needs to think about how do I find ways to communicate to this community, which is about to receive a new project, get a new bus line, have something change in their lives that they might not have asked for, but they deserve to know about. And that gets to this question that communication is multi-directional, continuous, and in a shared language. That doesn't just mean sending out a notice saying, oh, yes, there's a planning hearing show up, and it's printed this big, and it's in the local newspaper. Um, it means sort of thinking about all the means at our disposal and how designers, industrial designers, graphic designers, and architects, we're actually great translators of information into image. 
and to sort of help us figure out how to share what things might look like to actually be the illustrator for what people want to think about, about how their community, community is going to look. And so ideas that people have about their cities don't just come up at official presentations. When you are sitting in the audience and someone is saying, and this building will, you know, this is coming to your neighborhood, and you can either take it or leave it. You can complain about it, but you're already, it's already in the works, and you've probably all been to presentations like that. But ideally, that's not when you want people to know about a project. So what are the tools and technologies we have to get people to communicate at picnics, on the sidewalk, in storefronts? Like if you have a big touch screen on a storefront downtown that says, you know, what would you like to see here? Chicago is doing that. Rahm Emanuel, um, who's the mayor of Chicago, has hired some of the brightest uh, technology thinkers pretty much out of IBM to help him figure out how to get people to communicate um, about what they want to see in their city. And they warm them up with funny little uh, graphics like cubs or socks. Like that was one, and then you sort of get them. Oh, this is a fun game, Cubs or Sox, you know. And then they play all that, and then all of a sudden, it's streetcar or rapid bus, you know, bike lane or more parking. And then they're sort of engaged in the game. So, technology can really get people involved who aren't just the usual ones who show up at the planning meetings. And finally, everyone has information, and everyone's information has value. And you know that everyone wants your information, right? This is where the privacy thing we all think is so creepy. Google's going to take our information and, well, I don't know, do what to it? I mean, on the one hand, you can say, well, it is a little creepy, but wouldn't I like to know more about stuff that I'm already interested in? So maybe the trade-off, Google's free. They know a little bit about me. Um, but it isn't so much about that, but it's really about um, listening learning to listen really carefully. And that goes back to all of the sort of framing that came before, listening to all the populations, um, remembering that just because someone didn't email you about it doesn't mean someone isn't thinking about it, that they might need another way to communicate. And so I'm going to finish with my last slide, which is a slide, it has a quote in it that I sort of use almost all the time because it's from an author that I love, which is uh, Calvino. And his great book, Invisible Cities, is a book that you can read over and over again. And he has this beautiful quote where he says, the city does not tell its past, but contains it like the lines of a hand. And that, to me, is such a beautiful description of the kind of somewhat mysterious intelligence. But if you think about the wrinkles and the blisters and the cuts that a city shows from the kind of work that it's had, the city has its own unique character. And so on the one hand, globalization sort of promises you can buy the same thing anywhere, and our Apple devices are the same everywhere. But one of the reasons I love visiting cities and want to spend all day here in Little Rock is every city has its own character, and that's actually part of its own unique intelligence. There's not a sort of abstract intelligent city. There are only individual intelligent cities. And because the city isn't really a machine, it's a lived-in thing. Efficiency isn't the goal necessarily, although we all want our cities to be efficient. We all want our cities to perform better and to save money and to do all of that. But we also want our, our cities to be creative, to be sustainable, to be livable, to be beautiful and just. And how are we going to do that? Well, intelligent cities, um, what makes an intelligent city? Well, it's intelligent citizens do. So. I'd be happy to take any questions if any of you have them, and I might answer some, but I might just ask you another question. So thank you. Thank you. We've got some time for some questions. If you would uh, like to uh, ask any, you can raise your hand, and please uh, wait for the microphone if anyone has any questions. Architects are silent. Well, let me just say, Susan, thank you very much thank for you. being here. This is her book. She's selling and signing uh, uh, at the conclusion of the program. So thank you all for coming, June. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will see you soon. Thanks.